Chapter 3 An Unexpected Encounter with a Surprising Stranger Do not live as if you have 10,000 years left. Your faith hangs over you. While you are still living, while you still exist on this earth, strive to become a genuinely great person. Written by Marcus Aurelius, Roman Emperor. The entrepreneur lied to the people she met at the seminar, telling them she was in the room to learn the spellbinders' fabulous formulas for exponential productivity as well as to discover the neuroscience beneath personal mastery that he had been sharing with leaders of industry. She mused that her expectation was that the Guru's methodology would give her an unmatchable edge over her firm's competition, allowing the business to shiftily scale towards indisputable dominancy. You know the real reason she was there. She needed her hope restored and her life saved. The artist had come to the event to understand how to fuel his creativity and multiply his capability so he could make an enduring mark on his filled by the paintings he had generated and the homeless man appeared to have sneaked into the conference hall while no one was watching the entrepreneur and the artist had been seated together this was the first time they had met do you think he's dead she asked as the artist visited with his dangling bob marley dreadlocks the entrepreneur's face was angular and long a wealth of wrinklings and weighty cravels ran along her forehead like runs in a farmer's fresh field. Her brown hair was medium in length and styled in an I mean business and day not to mess with me kind of a way. She was lean like a long distance runner with thin arms and live legs that emerged from a sensible blue designer skirt. Her eyes looked sad from old hurts that had never been healed and from the current chaos that was infecting her beloved company. Not sure, he's old. He fell hard. God, that was wild. Never seen anything like it, the artist said anxiously as he tugged on an earring. I am new to this work. I am not into this sort of thing. The entrepreneur explained. She stayed seated, her arms folded over a cream-colored blouse with a colossal floppy black bow tie preached fashionably at the neckline. But I liked a lot of his information on productivity in this era of devices destroying our focus and our ability to think deeply. His words made me realize I have to guard my cognitive assets in a far better way she carried on fairly formally. She had no real interest in sharing what she was going through and she obviously wanted to protect her facade of an illustrious businesswoman ready to race to the next level. Yeah, his deaf hip, said the artist looking nervous. He helped me so much, can't believe what just went down. Surreal right. He was a painter because he wanted to elevate his craft as well as improve his personal life. He followed the spellbinder's work. But for whatever reason, the demons within him seemed to hold power over his greater nature. So he'd inevitably sabotage his Herculean, ambitious and wonderful original ideas. The artist was heavy. A goatee jetted out from under his chin. He wore a black t-shirt and long black shorts that fell below his knobby knees. Black boots with rubber soles, the kind you may have seen Australians wear, completed the creative uniform. A fascinating cascade of tattoos rolled down both arms and across his left leg. One said, rich people are fakers. Another stole in a line from Savido Dali. The famed Spanish artist, it read simply, I don't do drugs, I am drugs. Hi guys, the homeless man spoke inappropriately loudly from a few rows behind the entrepreneur and the artist. The auditorium was still emptying and the audiovisual crew was noisily tearing down the staging. Even staff swept the floor. A night maze on the wax song played soothingly in the background. The two new acquaintances turned around to see a tangled mess of wild person hair, a face that looked like it hadn't been shaved in decades, and a tattered arrangement of terrifically stained clothing. 
Yes, ask the entrepreneur in a turn as cold as an ice cube in the Arctic. Can I help you? Hey brother, what's up? Offered the artist more compassionately. The homeless man got up, shuffled over and sat next to the two. Do you think the guru's crowd? He asked as he picked a test cup on one of his wrists. Not sure, the artist replied as he twirled another dreadlock. Hope not. Did you guys like the seminar? You into what the old timer said, continued the scruffy stranger. Deaf, said the artist. I love his work. I have a hard time living it all. But what he says is profound and powerful. I'm not sure, the entrepreneur said cynically. I like a lot of what I heard today. But I am still not convinced on some other things. I will need some time to process it all. Well, I think his numero uno stated the homeless man with a bub. I made my fortune, thanks to the teachings of the spellbinder, and have enjoyed a pretty world class life because of him too. Most people wish for phenomenal things to happen to them. He taught me that exceptional performance make phenomenal things happen to them. And the great thing is he not only gave me a secret philosophy to get my big dreams done but he taught me the technology, the tactics and the tools to translate the information into results. His revolutionary insight on how to install a fiercely productivity morning routine alone retransformed the impact I have had on my marketplace. A jagged scar ran along the homeless man's forehead just above his right eye. His threatening beard was grey. Around his neck he spotted a beaded necklace like the ones Indian holy men wear at their temples. Though his hyperbole made him sound unstable and his visage made it appear that he had lived on the streets for many years, his voice displayed an irregular sense of authority, and his eyes revealed the confidence of a lion. Total crackpot, the entrepreneur whispered to the artist. If he's got a fortune, I am Mother Teresa. Got you. He seems insane, the artist replied, but checked out his humongous watch. On the left wrist of the homeless man who seemed to be in his late 60s was one of those massive timepieces that British hedge fund managers are prone to wear when they go out to dinner in Mayfair. It had a dial the color of a revolver surrounded by a stainless steel rim and red needle thin hour hand and a sunset orange minute hand. This noteworthy badge of honor was united with a white black rubber strap lending a diver-like feel to the whole luxurious look. A hundred grand easily, said the entrepreneur discreetly. Some of the people at my shop bought watches like that the day after our IPO. Unfortunately, our share price plummeted. But they kept their damn timepieces. So, what part of the spellbinder stock did you cats like best? The vagabond asked, still scratching his wrist. Was it all the stuff about the psychology of genius that he started out with? Or maybe those incredible models he thought on the productivity hacks of billionaires that he jammed on in the middle? Maybe you were stoked by all the neurobiology that creates top performance or did you vibe with his theory on our responsibility to reach legendary while serving as an instrument for the benefit of humanity that he walked us through before the dramatic finish the homeless man then winked and glanced at his big watch hey dudes this has been fun but time is one of the most precious commodities I have learned to bulletproof. Warren Buffett, the brilliant investor, said the rich invest in time, the poor invest in money. So I can't hang with you humans too long. Got a meeting with a jet and a runway, know what I mean? He seems to be delusional, thought the entrepreneur. Buffett also said, I buy expensive suits, they just look cheap on me. Maybe you will remember the quote too. And she continued, I really don't mean to be rude, but I am not sure how you got in here and I have no idea where you got the fat watch from or what jet you are talking about. 
and please stop speaking the way you do about what happened at the presentation nothing funny about it seriously i am not sure the gentleman still breathing deaf true the artist agreed as he stroked his goatee not cool and why do you talk like a surfer Hey guys, chill," said the homeless man. "First, I am a surfer. I spent my teenage years on a board in Malibu. Used to ride near a point where the rat breaks on. Now I surf the smaller waves in Tamarind Bay, a spot you cats have probably never been to. Never heard of a place. You are fairly outrageous," the entrepreneur said frostily. The homeless man was unstoppable. And second, I have been very successful in the business world. I have built a bunch of companies that are extremely profitable in this age of firms making billions in income at nothing on their bottom line. What a joke! The world's going on a little berserk. Too much greed and not enough good sense. And third, if I may, he added as his gravelly voice grew stronger, there is a plane waiting for me. on a tarmac not so far from here so before i go i will ask you again because i want to know what part of the spellbinders presentation did you two like best pretty much the whole thing the artist answered loud it all so much i recorded every word the old legend said that's illegal cautioned the homeless man crossing his arms firmly you could get into serious lawyer trouble doing that It is against the law, confirmed the entrepreneur. Why would you do that? Because I wanted to. Just felt like it. I do what I want to. Rules are made for destruction, you know. Picasso said, "You should learn the rules like a pro, so you can break them like an artist." Need to be myself, not some sheep with no balls, blindly following the flock down a path that leads to nowhere. Most people, especially people with cash, are nothing but a bunch of frauds," declared the artist. "It's like the spellbinder sometimes says, 'You can fit in, or you can change the world. You don't get to do both.' So I recorded the whole thing. Shoot me, and jail would be interesting. I would probably meet some cool people in there." Hmm. Okay," said the homeless man. "I don't like your decision, but I do love your passion. So go ahead, bring it on. Play the parts of the seminar that turned you on. Everything I recorded will blow your mind." The artist raised his arm to reveal a detailed tattoo of guitar, which was so Jimi Hendrix. The phrase "When the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace" appeared over the death superstar's face. You are about to hear something special," he added. "Yes, go ahead and play the parts you liked," encouraged the entrepreneur as she stood up. She wasn't quite sure why, but ever so slightly, something was beginning to shift deep within her core. Maybe life has been breaking me down," she thought. "So I can make some sort of a breakthrough." Being at this event, meeting the artist, hearing the spellbinder words, even if she did not agree with all he said, was giving her the feeling that what she was experiencing at her firm just might be some form of preparation demanded by her greatness. The entrepreneur was still skeptical, but she sensed she was opening and possibly growing. So she promised herself she would keep following this process instead of retreating. Her former way of existing no longer served her. It was time for a change. The entrepreneur thought about a quote she loved from Theodore Roosevelt: "It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the door of deeds could have." done them better the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is mud by dust and sweat and blood who strives valiantly who errs who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms the great devotions the who spends himself in a worthy cause who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst if he fails at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat She also recalled the phrase she had learned from the spellbinders address something like the moment when you most feel like giving up in is the instant when you must find it in you to press ahead 
and so the business woman reached deep within herself and made a vow to continue her quest to find her answers solve her problems and experience vastly better days her hope was gradually expanding and her worries were slowly shrinking and the small still voice of her finest self was beginning to whisper that a very special adventure was about to begin